Hey guys, Alex and Dad from 7th Hour Films back again with Doctor Who Classic. Last time around we had Death to the Daleks. What was that one about? <laughs> I honestly do not remember. Uh, I was thinking before we came in, last thing I remember was watching the end of uh, Invasion of the Dinosaurs. Death to the Daleks was a short four-parter. Yes. And I've literally forgotten everything about it. Yes, so uh, the Doctor and Sarah Jane arrive on this planet. The TARDIS has lost its power. And That's there's, right, the Exelons. Yeah, there's this human crew who have also lost power to their ship. The Daleks land here. They've lost power to not only their ships, but also their weapons in their uh, shells. And so everyone tries to work together to figure out how to get the power back on, and everyone's trying to get this uh, specific mineral that can cure a disease. And uh, then there's some treachery I guess I mean it's the Daleks but they basically figure out how to take over there's this whole thing about getting into the holy city and shutting down the ultimate computer that is alive and runs this place and and there was a guy that supposedly was running it but he turned out to be nothing yeah. and it was it was very <coughs> it's, it's a forgettable episode sorry it just really yeah. was it's, it's some interesting ideas you know trying to work with Daleks and stuff like that but kind of just fell apart so it was interesting that they managed to adapt from their normal weapons to shooting bullets yeah so uh so a few interesting things in that one yeah. uh today we have a very i'm gonna say low energy reaction because <laughs> uh, the two of us are kind of tired so we just came back from the oklahoma city festival of the arts it's a very warm and windy day and we are somewhat toasted yeah so uh, we are just going to we can be we're going to be very low energy. You may hear it in our voices a bit that we're, they're a bit ragged. So, yeah, <coughs> but it's we only got three parts today, so we're just gonna we're just gonna chill. We're just gonna watch this, and it's all gonna be and fine. And this is a return to Peladon. Yes, the monster of Peladon, which we went to the Curse of Peladon. That was season nine, so that was about two seasons ago now. So I'm curious if any of the same characters are there. Um, but I do remember uh, they actually reference this on the Sarah Jane adventures because it's something that Sarah Jane and Joe have in common is that they went to Peladon. Hmm. So, um, so yeah. But I'm not really sure what we're going to be expecting from this. I mean, the monster of Peladon, there was a monster of Peladon already. Yeah, so. wasn't it uh, Agador or something like that? Yeah, I think yeah. so. The giant elf-looking dude <laughs> that uh, the doctor did the lullaby on which was narun 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 but was to the tune of god rest you merry gentlemen yes it was a venusian lullaby yes for a venusian christmas so um i'm sure <laughs> that that is a plot somewhere i mean they especially when you get into the modern era and pretty much every season uh just about every season has uh has a christmas special they do go ahead and uh, say, like, yes, well, Christmas it evolved past Earth. So, you know, they go, like, 3,000 years in the future, like, eight galaxies over. And it's like, oh, yeah, we're celebrating Christmas. So, <laughs> so yeah. I mean, they would even... They, they were very insistent on keeping Christmas specials. Yeah. Like, even if there wasn't a season of Doctor Who going on that year, they would still come back for a Christmas special. Um that reminds me, in the uh, Star Trek original series, there was a time when the uh, Enterprise landing crew landed on a planet which was essentially a copy of the Roman Empire. Uh, and there were a group of insurgents who called themselves sun worshippers, and they were trying to overthrow the Empire. And it's only at the very end uh, that you find out that it's not the sun, the star in the sky, but when Lieutenant Uhura says, no, I've been monitoring their communications, they, they're they re literally referring to they are worshippers of the Son of God. So the idea was, you know, Christianity has spread either throughout the universe or has been throughout the universe, and here on Earth we only know that it was here. We didn't know it had spread to other planets. That was the idea, I think. The original series was very weird. It could be. Th yes. They did a lot of those episodes where it's like, well, it looks like, you know old-timey New York here yeah. because, you know, they're filming some drama across the across the street so we can borrow their costumes yeah. for a week. Uh, what I thought was kind of subtle, their gladiators were all wearing these what looked appeared to be cut-off sweatshirts, but there was an emblem in the middle that was just a chain 
rather than you know a cross or anything that would be obviously Christian. Well, yeah. Um, I don't know if I don't know if Doctor Who has ever actually gone back to like uh, the birth of Jesus or the crucifixion or anything. It, he has referenced it. The tenth Doctor once said that uh, he got the last room in Bethlehem. So that's why they went to the manger, because he was the one who got the last room. So, um, Makes you wonder if that was in any way connected to uh, what uh, David Tennant did in Good Omens, because they were there at the crucifixion. He and, and Aziraphale yeah. were there. Crowley and Aziraphale were at the crucifixion. Yeah, that and was you true. remember there was a great uh, dialogue between them. What did he do? He just And the other one says, he told everyone just to be kind to each other. And Crowley goes, oh yeah, that'll do it. Yep. <laughs> So, I wonder, is there any uh, set date on season two of that? No, I haven't heard anything. Yeah. They're, I mean, they're probably still earlier in production, yeah. so. Uh, but we'll have to see. Anywho. Anywho. That was a tangent. <laughs> Monster of Peladon. Just because we're low energy doesn't mean we can't <laughs> ramble on about stuff nobody cares about. We just ramble slower. Exactly. So, why don't we go ahead and just hop into the Monster of Peladon. Here we go. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's Peladon, all right. I hope the doctor lands somewhere better. Oh, that's new. Oh yeah. So is their hair. And the spirit of Agador appeared and slew one of us for blasphemy. Who do you think's going to use your alien equipment now? One of our people has been killed. The miners are terrified and refuse to work. What oh, sweet. You Alpha Centauri is here. Explain, is it? Your Majesty, we people of the planet oh, this guy's new. are a practical race of mining engineers. We do not propose to accept that this unfortunate incident was brought about by supernatural means. The miners of Peladon say that Avador appeared to them. Your Majesty, the your king. miners are primitive and superstitious. The sooner we can achieve full production of trisilicate, the sooner we can bring this dreadful war to a successful conclusion. Thank you. Looks much better than the last time. Well, yeah. The audience is at an end. A lot more veiny. Thank you, Your Majesty. Well, at least you're not going to fall from here. Paladin, Sarah. No, not exactly. No, it's not your precious citadel at all. It's another rotten, gloomy old tunnel. It's <laughs> the scanner still on the blink. Oh, why don't we just go back to the TARDIS? But for two good reasons. One, that I don't want to leave Peladon without having a word with my good friend the King. Name dropper. And second, what? we are lost. Come on. <laughs> Can't even get back to the TARDIS. Your Majesty, everything is prepared. May we begin? Yes. Nexus. If you'll just keep your eyes you on that section of the wall over there. Somewhat of a satyr type character. Well. There's nothing to fear, to be a fool. Come back. Ah, man. And he was interesting, too. Maybe there'll be more of him. Or maybe he was just transported somewhere. I almost feel like the name should have been swapped. This should have been cursed, and the first one should have been Monster. May I first know whom I have the honor of addressing? I am Ultra, High Priest and Chancellor. This is Her Majesty Queen Thalira of Belladon. Oh, she actually has a name. Your Majesty, <laughs> I cannot tell you how shocked I was to Doctor! hear- Doctor! What's that? The answer to all our trouble, Sarah. Doctor! Hey! Alpha Centauri. It is! So it is the same Alpha one. Alpha Centauri, my dear fella. What a very well-timed entrance. It's like a miracle, Doctor! All these years, and you haven't changed a bit! Neither of you, my dear fella. A touch of grey around the tentacles, perhaps, is <laughs> the same on Alpha. And We shall expect a full report of their behaviour, and of their presence on Peladon. Of course, Your Majesty. Thank you, Your Majesty. Well, I don't think that's good enough. What about an apology? Oh, for the don't, don't come with me, please. I mean, quit while you're ahead. He was the one who persuaded King Peladon to join the Federation and caused our present troubles. Now, why has he come here again? We shall not learn the Doctor's plans by having him executed, Orchon. If he is our enemy, he will soon betray himself. <laughs> Can they not find a decent chancellor? You will all wait for me here. When I've spoken to the Queen, talk again. Now these guys were not part of the last serial, were they? No. Oh, 
I am impressed that they've kept what appears to be the same you set for two years. What's so important about this tricylicate stuff? Our whole technology is based on electronic circuitry, heat shields, inert microcell fibers, radionic crystals, and whoever controls the supply of tricylicate will win this war. And you think someone's Isn't this the plot of Dune? That's what Vegan Nexus thought. You don't seem very worried. They're wasting their time. Solid Duralinium, that door. Triple security, electronic lock, remotely controlled from here. Just I wonder who well, makes up all these all fake the words. <laughs> I believe that human beings sometimes find the appearance of my species rather frightening. Yet I assure you, we are an amiable and peace-loving race. Oh, I'm, well, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to be rude. I'm not really frightening is utterly hilarious. <laughs> How can you help us? By proving my belief that the appearances of Adador are caused by trickery. We will trust you, Doctor, for the present. I mean, shouldn't it be, like, Captain. common knowledge that Agador was just a little animal? The Queen's champion will escort you. Well, after you, Ocha. Didn't he fight the King's champion before? Yeah, he wasn't as big as this guy. I gotta admit, again, the costumes and sets on this one are very, very good. Well, yeah. Well, don't tell me that you're frightened, big chap like you. Come on. The royal champion can never talk. Ah! Ow. No. Well, it, he's actually there, so well, give him that. It's a bit more elaborate than the, the animal. You know, Peladon always feels like a Star Trek episode. <laughs> There's this sort of civil, civilized but almost uncivilized place, you know, more yeah. feudal, I guess. Yeah. And, you know, they have to deal with it. It feels, definitely feels more like a next-gen episode, though, like... Captain Picard would have to come in with his diplomacy and stuff to get things done. So, and then you send Data off to go uh, investigate some of this stuff. Um, but yeah, v very very interesting, and also picking up on Peladon fifty years later. Yeah. Um, it is just very interesting though that the sets are exactly the same. Yeah. You know, we kind of talk about like, oh, do they keep some of these sets around here, you know, set pieces, uh, just use them, but. They, I mean, they haven't used this this no. stuff for but two years. I would suspect uh, when they built the first set, you know, having uh, built sets myself, now I've never actually designed one on paper, but most set designers do actually build it on paper first. Uh, and that way uh, they can then give it to the construction guys who can then piece it together. So I would imagine they simply went back, if they didn't store those pieces, they went back to the original plans and said, hey, this is what it is, and they could have probably slapped it together just in a couple of days. Yeah, because, I mean, stuff like the throne room, it's not the most detailed. You know, you just got to have a uh, a room, you know, you put the mountain of furs and then, a, you know, wood chair at the top there. So, um, and then just get the pillars and some of the... Uh, some of the torches right and caves caves are easy enough on doctor who they yeah. probably have an entire warehouse of caves <laughs> that they've used over the past 11 years yeah. so um but yeah it moved right along <coughs> yeah and again most people would have remembered even though it had been two seasons before they would have remembered the original peloton yeah so um and again like you said the chancellor is very much in the vein of the chancellor before yeah, which is interesting because because he specifically says he worked with King Peladon after that would have been after Hepesh died uh, in that episode, but he seems to be the one who is like, well, yes, I went along with a lot of what your father said, but you know it's difficult to trust some of these guys and everything. Um, although he is, I guess, trying to you know suppress this sort of rebellion from happening as well. So I guess you know he's kind of looking at. He's looking at everything and just seeing what's best for the queen, basically. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and and it's also just interesting, just this whole thing of you know, you know, fifty years ago, Peladon, there were so many people that didn't want to join the Federation. Fifty years later, it's kind of the same. You know, people are having doubts still about the Federation. Yeah. Um, but 
hey, at least Alpha Centauri is the same. It's the only delegate that's the same from yeah. uh, the first one. So, yeah, wasn't uh, wasn't one of the delegates one of the Mars guys? Yeah, the Ice Warriors. The Ice Warriors, yeah, yeah. They they were like the they were the the other good ones, yeah. and then uh, the guy in the little machine. Yeah, uh, Arturus or something. Arcturus. Yeah, Ar- Ar- Arcturus, yeah. and then. I'm getting my episodes mixed up because I'm I'm thinking of I thought there was only the three of them. Might have been. And then the doctor took the place of the Earth representative. Yeah, that was probably it. And then the Ice Warriors, they killed Ar- Arcturus because he tried to kill the doctor. Yeah, that was it. I was trying to think of this like uh this other like squiddy alien looking dude, but I think that's a later episode that we watched, like a six doctor episode or something. So um so yeah, it's it's a shame about uh, that. What was it the guy from Vega, the uh, satyr looking dude? Because it was an interesting design. The eyes were a little yeah. wonky, but o- overall it was an interesting costume. And it's like, well, I kind of want to see more of that. So I will have to tell you though that I bet that was very uncomfortable because yeah. on his bare arms they had actually have to glue all that fake hair on. Yeah, yeah. I've I've had to wear a uh, false beard before. Uh, it, if the director had told me uh, when the show was cast, I could have grown a beard in the two months between the time of the casting and the start of rehearsals and then the show. But, you know, it's like a week before the show, he says, oh, yeah, all you guys are going to need beards. And we went, eh. So every night had to put the glue on the face mm. and then put the beards on. That's such a weird thing, too, because it's like, yeah, un- unless you're just terrible at growing a beard, a guy can grow a beard, you know? It yeah. doesn't... It doesn't take too terribly long to do it, but yeah, like you should you gotta say something about that. Because uh, here's the next question: How realistic did that beard look? I mean, now granted, it's you know if you're on stage, it's yeah. far away. So uh, the stage uh, we were doing um, Robert Bolt's uh, Viva Regina. I was playing William Cecil, so yeah, I was never really more than fifteen to twenty feet uh, near the audience because we had a really large kind of apron on the stage that wasn't used most of the stuff was upstage but yeah I, I have a couple of pictures from that <coughs> show and if you look very carefully you can see my mustache is real because I still had a mustache at that okay. point and I could have grown a beard again if they had simply told us that's what they wanted that was my next question was was there a fake mustache too no I fortunately it was my own mustache because that that would I, I imagine that would be awkward if you also I guess if you had a fake mustache that if it connected to the beard yeah. too that'd probably restrict a lot of your all over your mouth. I don't think I've ever had to wear a fake mustache. Hmm. Because I, I grew my mustache between my freshman and sophomore year of college. This would have been 19, summer of 1970. And again, other than shaving it off for certain roles where I have to be clean shaven, I've had it for, you know, 50 something years. Hmm. So you, but you haven't, the, the beard is sort of interspersed until you. Yeah. Whatever. How however long you've had this beard. The this beard I have had since uh, two thousand seven when I played uh, President Roosevelt, President Theodore Roosevelt. Right. Um, before that, I can't remember. I I know that I had to shave it off in the eighties for a role, but I don't remember what that was. Hmm. Late eighties was the last time I had it off before that. So. Yeah, and I've never shaved my beard off since I grew it. So, um, and I I feel like I've said this before on on one of these videos when we go on a tangent about nothing for five minutes. Um, but looking back on it now, like because my beard it's remained relatively the same since I grew it uh, senior year of high school uh, when you finally told me how to grow a beard. Um, and l- thinking back on it now, there were a lot of guys in my high school that did have facial hair but they, it was all terrible yeah nobody could grow a proper beard and i was sitting over here just with this and it looks i mean i i try to keep it up as best i can but it certainly looked a whole lot better i saw a lot of patchy like yeah. and the guys that just have the neck hair 
it's, yeah. It, you know, it's it's obviously still peach fuzz, but they just don't shave it off. And we yeah. have a lot of that at my high school. It looks really bad. Yeah. And I, I mean, that's kind of how I was for a while. I would just get neck hair and I would just shave it off and that just kept going and going. And I remember I asked you, like, okay, how do you, how do you just grow a beard? And I think the answer you gave me was just, well, just keep going. It'll grow in eventually. And I was like, it's not, that's not doing anything. So eventually I was like, okay, is, is there any, any sort of trick to this? And you were like, well, here, let me just, I can shape it into a beard and then it'll, that'll just keep growing. And then it worked. And I remember thinking, well, you could have told me this like a year ago, man. Anyway, we're not here to air grievances about beards or anything. <laughs> so, um, any for the Doctor Who, stay for the beards. Exactly. I mean, uh... Peladon, they have some, you know, rocking multicolored beards and multicolored hair. Yeah. So, uh, Peladon, the king, was pretty much the only one who didn't have a beard in that episode, if I recall correctly. Because uh, Hepesh and all the other guys did. Yeah. Yeah. Except, I mean, like, some of the guards, I think, were clean shaven, but, like, yeah, Hepesh and uh, uh, the original the original guy that, like, dies at the beginning, uh, they all had beards, but they all still had the, 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 you know, the white streak in their hair. Yeah. Which I'm glad that not only do not only does uh, Ortron still have that, but the Queen also has that yeah. uh, behind her crown. So it's also just interesting that she has a crown, um, and it's probably for the best that she doesn't have the ridiculous shorts that her dad was wearing in that episode because that costume was a bit strange. Well, again, we were talking about how that was. Uh uh, late medieval, uh, early Renaissance, the, because they wore tunics and then tights. But the women would, from low Middle Ages right up through the Renaissance, always had full length gowns on. Right. Um, but then also Hepesh and now Ortron also have the the robes yeah. as well. So I'm restoring the holy mountain to appease the spirit of Agador. <laughs> Very well edited special effect there. Yeah. Which alien it is? I don't know, a new one. Tall, white hair. The Doctor. Our one friend among the aliens. <laughs> I like that Gabak isn't just a... I don't know, he's not stupid. Oh, good jump. We'd better go and get her out of there. You know, this guy kind of looks like Tom Baker. Lives have always been the same. I tell you, I did see someone in there before all the noise and lights started. There's nobody in there. And nobody's getting in there. Mm. Are you well enough to move? Mm, that seems a bit sus. I wonder. Do you suppose that's actually the old king that they've locked away for 50 years? He wasn't that old. Yeah. Could be. You know, I expect more from palace guards. Close the door. No. You know, I miss the Ice Warriors. Because they'd be dropping people left and right. I was unable to stand by and let him inflict violence on a fellow creature. What is she now? Presumably she's still Ennis's prisoner. I feel bad for the actor that has to keep bouncing around inside of there. Oh, mighty Agador, make known thy will. How shall we punish those who have offended against me? It'd be hilarious if the animal showed up and recognized the doctor. The girl was Edis's prisoner, not his accomplice. You must believe that, Your Majesty. That mean Eckersley is part I'm of it? I'm prepared to trust your judgment, Ambassador. Maybe. But what I believe is of little importance. In the temple, Ortron's power is absolute. There is nothing I can do. Maybe if he can depose the monarchy, he can... Dude, just get rid of a couple rebels and take everything he needs. But your majesty, All right. The last time we saw the queen, there was a woman standing next to her, wasn't there? Yeah. Many things have changed on Paladin, your majesty. 
Perhaps this too should change. You will come with me. I mean, this is like the exact same coming of age story that her father went through. Yeah. Oh, I was kind of hoping the pit would be the fighting pit, not this little hole. Oh, good catch. Where is the girl? We can walk. The girl and the doctor have gone to face the judgment of Agador. Well, warm up your voice. Start singing. I mean, he's already dealt with this thing once before. Should be alright. <laughs> you know, because you mentioned is e uh, Eckersley. Eckersley in on it. I'm curious if maybe uh, Ortron is in on it too. That's entirely possible. Yeah. yeah. If they're trying to... Because I would imagine maybe they're trying to get rid of the Federation... Maybe, because, I mean, that's essentially what Hepesh was doing in the last one, was that you gotta... They want to get rid of the Federation, just be Peladon, only Peladon, and Peladon first. They'll put up a wall around the planet, you know, that sort of stuff. In PGA, make Peladon great again. Yeah. So, it could be, but then you have... You obviously have... The more reasonable people like the Queen and Gebek uh, and Alpha Centauri, who are, you know, who realize. Well, I'm not even sure if they, you know, if Gebek is entirely pro Federation, but he's trying to. He's at least more sensible than yeah, he's the others. Well, he's trying to alleviate the problems of his people. Yeah, so. Um, so, yeah, it is very interesting stuff, at least, so. Um, it's also interesting that this one is longer than the first one, because this is six episodes instead of four. So, it's also interesting uh, that they've mentioned Galaxy 5. I remember we had an episode called Galaxy 4, but honestly, I don't remember too much about that episode. Uh, I think that's the one that introduced the Chumblies, yeah. but that was it. Uh, and in Dalek's Master Plan, didn't they mention, like, ten galaxies or something? Something like that, yeah. yeah. So. Come on, back on old chap. That's nowhere to greet an old friend. You remember me, surely? Sing it. No. I like that he simultaneously looks better and worse than he did last time. Yay. You think anyone's invented the Venusian language based off of this? Come and tickle his ears, Sarah. Not likely. <laughs> <laughs> Not bloody likely. <laughs> Visiting time's over. Get us out of here. It's a great shot. Release them from the pit immediately. Oh, this is awkward. There she is. Well. Cheers and refreshments for our guests. You will please accept our apologies. Well, not at all, Your Majesty. In fact, I was delighted to meet Agador again. You miss it. I love how tall her chair is. What advice did the doctor mean? Well, it's going to be rather difficult to explain, but I think he was referring to women's lib. And what's that? <laughs> women's liberation, Your Majesty. The ruler is always a man. I was only crowned because my father had no son. It's Ortron who holds the real power. Well, only if you let him, you've just got to stand up for yourself. It would be different if I was a man. But I'm only a girl. Ah, just a minute. <laughs> There's nothing only about being a girl, Your Majesty. Never mind why they made you a queen. The fact is, you are the queen, so... Just you jolly well let them know it. <laughs> the Doctor will remain imprisoned where he can do no further harm. 
and I shall give orders for the arrest of his female companion. No, Ortron, that you will not. The girl Sarah will remain at liberty. As your majesty wishes. Since she is only a female, her activities are of little importance. <laughs> you don't piss off the queen. You're about to rip that beard right off your chin. Our ship is now in orbit over the planet. Oh, it's a nice warrior. Their mind was destroyed. Yes, but don't worry, old chap. They had mines. It's Nicholas' patent alarm system. Well, someone is hiding down there without your knowing. Look, or with wrong, his knowing. No harm done. All right, Chancellor. We'll trust you this time. Thank you, men of Teladon. I'm glad that good sense has prevailed. This is an interesting situation they're all in. <laughs> <laughs> we all have to look good in front of the principal. They're coming this way, Doctor. That should do it. Should open now. Oh. All right, it's the warriors. <laughs> They're already here. Thought they were on their way. Wow, this this looks bad. <laughs> I thought the ice warriors were peaceful now. Yeah. Aside from the like ten bodies they dropped in the last episode. Oh. All righty. Well, that's the first three parts. Well, that's certainly. <coughs> One of the better ones we've seen in a while. It certainly beats, you know, boring Daleks. Mm -hmm. uh, not quite as much fun <coughs> as, uh, uh, oh, Iron Gron and the Santarans. Yeah, in the Time but, Warrior. The Time Warrior. Uh, but yeah, interesting story. <coughs> I mean, seriously, twists and turns. Every time you turn yeah. around, something else is happening. Yeah, it's like there's. I mean, there's. What I feel like are the innocent ones, the Queen and Gebek, but then it's like, okay, you really have to try, like, where does everybody fall on this? Because you've got, uh, was it, Edis and the Miners. They, they're pretty obvious, like, alright, they're 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 doing this because they want all the Federation troops, every Federation thing off of Peladon, go back to the old ways and all that sort of stuff, which is not the greatest plan in the world, but you understand them at least. <clears throat> and then you've got, I guess Alpha Centauri also, I would say counts as an innocent one. Uh, I don't think he's very, you know, in on what's happening. But you've got Eckersley, who definitely feels like, it, he, I would say he's more looking at Peladon as just, he's just looking at the mineral. Yeah. So he's just doing everything he can to get that mineral, yeah. and he doesn't really care about yeah. the now, barbarians. If, if he's not one of the bad guys, then they're certainly trying to divert us from the real bad guys because he does look suspicious. Yeah. <coughs> and I mean, everything with the refinery at least seems suspicious. And the fact that, I mean, the fact that there's just an ice warrior in there for some reason. Um, and then you've got Ortron, who I guess would be... I guess he would be similar to the miners because he... I imagine he doesn't want Federation presence on Peladon, but he also is trying to keep... Well, he's trying to keep power to himself yeah. uh, instead of the Queen. He's trying to keep the nobility. So so it's an interesting sort of thing that even when, even when people sort of want similar things, they're still on sort of opposite sides. Yeah. And in the middle of all of this, obviously, is Sarah and the Doctor. So... <coughs> So yeah, and then now we have this whole twist with the Ice Warriors already being there and being in the refinery, which is interesting. Because um, yeah, you know, Federation troops coming in is one thing. It's like, oh, the Ice Warriors, you know, they were our big allies last time. But now it seems that they may be pulling off this Agador trick. Yeah. So, so yeah, definitely like 10,000 different things going on. But But I like that. And I like how... You know, even though it's everybody's sort of on their different side, they're all also trying to come together uh, to, you know, make sure everything looks good for the troops, basically. And underneath it all, of course, is the Sarah's, uh, Sarah and the Queen trying to get her to understand that <coughs> she is the Queen, she has final authority, and even though that's not the way she was brought up, she's slowly beginning to understand that, you know, this is a thing. Yeah, and I mean... It, it's also interesting, too, because 
you would think that her father would be more forward thinking about that stuff because he was one of the driving forces with you know joining the federation and stuff but didn't she say that he died when she was very young that's true so she, she would have been raised by a regent most likely her mother or who's the ortron ortron the yeah the chancellor so yeah i, I suppose that's entirely possible um which wasn't that also the case for King Peladon. Like, there was something about that. At least he had been sort of brought up by uh, his council, basically. Yeah. <clears throat> so, now I will say, uh, when it's like, alright, let's take this moment, and she, you know, Sarah specifically says, you know, women's liberation specifically and stuff. I kind of sit back and think... Wow, and people say, and not to, not as a criticism of this, but I just sort of sit here and it's like, wow, people say modern Doctor Who is preachy. <laughs> not that this, I'm not saying this as a complaint. I thought it was a good moment here, yeah. and it, it works for both Sarah and the Queen's characters. Yeah. yeah, and again, that was very big in the early 70s. And again, there were a lot of women. <coughs> uh, I think the younger women understood it better, but there were a lot of uh, women in their 30s and 40s and 50s who said, but... That's never the way it has been before. You know, we've always essentially been mothers, wives, housekeepers. You know, women in the workforce was not a thing. Uh, So women's liberation really did kind of resound with the younger generation. And I think that's one of the reasons why Sarah can tell her, listen, you know, you may be a young woman, but you're still a woman. And beyond that, you are the queen. Yeah. And nobody can tell you what to do, not even your own counselor. Right, right. It's just so interesting. Because I remember I heard a lot about, um, because there's a whole lot of, you know, complaints around modern Doctor Who that, oh, it's too woke and that sort of, <laughs> that sort of garbage. I just sort of, you know, pass Good that Lord, off. That's what science fiction's all about. Yeah. But that's the thing is, I, I remember I've seen a lot of people that say, if you think, you know, there's a lot of, like, politics or social issues and stuff in modern Doctor Who, the era to go back to is John Pertwee's because that does happen and we've seen that yeah. has been brought up a, a number of times yeah. so um, so yeah it is just one of those interesting things and you're right that a lot of science fiction is that you know? because when you do try to go back to you know the 1950s and you know male domination all that that's where you get into the dystopian stuff you know that's when you get into Hunger Games yeah. you know so Science fiction shows you the brighter side, what should be, whereas the dystopian stuff shows you this is what we used to be, and we must never go back to it. Yeah, um, and it's like I, I've heard like some of the recent Star Trek stuff that has been on, uh, I guess it's Paramount Plus now, um, but they're like I guess the head writer of that was like, well, it's kind of hard to do social issues and you know some of these big issues in you know in the future so maybe it's easier to go back in time and do these issues and it's like well you can do that but also think that you have a blank template that is the universe you go to a planet i mean how many episodes of star trek was like we're at this planet they've got this you know crazy thing that's going on you know wasn't there uh the episode of the original series where it was like it was the guys that were half of their face was black, the other half white. Yeah. But literally the difference between the two species was which side it was on. Yeah. So I think Kirk almost blew up the Enterprise or something. Yeah. So, yeah, it's like you don't need to... You don't need to go so far to do this, but practically every episode there has to be something about that. Yeah. So... I mean, and that was was Roddenberry's entire uh, thing, was he said, you know, we have to show the problems of today but in a way that people will not object to them because they'll say, oh, well, that's in the future. Yeah. Now, there is also the point that, while, yes, you know, sci-fi has to... There has to be a lot of this in a lot of sci-fi stories. It it does still have to be done well. Because there are examples, even in Doctor Who, of you not doing that well. And And even, like, in some where it's like... The first thing that pops into my mind is actually Invasion of the Dinosaurs. Like, you know, you've got these sort of, I guess, eco-terrorists and stuff like that, which they're, the point they were making was not a bad point. It's the execution of that story that just sort of falls apart, and yeah. I know we're, we're the only ones that believe this, apparently, but whatever. Um, I should get back out the jar, and we should start throwing in coins for that one. Um, but there's also... There was one episode with the 13th Doctor 
that was just terrible where it's like they land on this terrible planet and it's like oh we can barely breathe out here they're these weird alien monster creatures and you know the but basically the twist of the episode is that they're actually on earth in the far future and like they go into a tunnel and they see like russian on uh on this on the wall and it's like wait this is actually earth in the future what happened and at the end of the episode basically they're like oh my gosh i can't believe you know the earth was ruined and stuff and the doctor i swear she almost looks at the camera and says well you know you just need to you know change your ways humans or else and it like cuts to the the monster that's like supposed to be the evolved human monster thing because of the environment and i was like wow that was terrible <laughs> like we might as well have just brought in captain planet so so you gotta or wally yeah it's like you might as if you're gonna do a, a message like that that's fine if you want to do something topical or political or anything like that but you still gotta write a good story around it so and even this this isn't it's not that this entire story is written around this but this is you know good for the character of the queen yeah so um and also just a good moment for sarah jane as well so um but that is also the interesting thing is just that this is almost it's almost like a drop in the bucket of what's going on in this episode because there's just way too much yeah. other <laughs> stuff and in a good way like i'm not saying like it's overcrowded you're just trying to fit yeah. all the pieces together. Yeah, it's a it's a very nice puzzle. And again, like you said, we're just slowly putting all the pieces together. Right. Uh, so yeah, let's see. Um, uh, da, da, da. Well, so we have the Rebellion and you get back and, and everything like that. Again, I just do like how... Uh, I like that moment where, you know, they, they let Sarah and uh, Eckersley go... And Edis is like, oh, you know, you should have just killed them. You know, you're you're too soft or whatever. And Gebek just says yes, and you're a fool. So it's like it's 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 very interesting because you know Edis is very you know understandably he's he's younger, he's more hot headed, and Gebek who is older, he understands you know he understands a few more things. Not that he you know doesn't want to have change with you know his his workers and stuff, but this armed rebellion just isn't a good idea. Uh, and it's interesting how uh, Gebek and Edis are the opposite of the Queen and... What's his name? Ortron. Ortron. Because he's the older one who's saying, you know, violence, violence, and she's going, no, we need... we need. So, yeah, it's, it's an interesting interplay of the older guy and the younger guy, and this time it's switched with the, the Queen, who, who's trying to be peaceful, and Ortron, who's, you know, just another megalomaniac... Yeah. You know, shoot first and ask questions later. Right, which is interesting because honestly, the the Queen and Ortron, they're very much like King Peladon and Hepesh from the first story, but you know, you I I like the they can get away with it, them basically being almost the same characters because we do have all this other stuff that's happening. So So yeah, that was really interesting. Uh we've got the Trisilicate yeah. Is which powers all their tech or something like that. Uh, but that's, again, that's very common. Uh, remember, uh, again, I know we're over referencing Star Trek, but dilithium crystals yeah. uh, and the, the transnator <coughs> was the basis of all, you know, the, the it was the basis of the uh, transporter beam. It's also the basis of their uh, interstellar communicator and uh, all this other stuff. So, yes, it makes sense that, you know, you've got this very important mineral on a very backward planet. You've got all of these other Federation groups. And again, this is very similar to that whole colonialism thing that we talked about earlier, yeah. where they need this stuff and are willing to do pretty much anything to get it. Right, right. Um, it is also just interesting, like, we should have, like, kept a list of how many minerals exist in this universe because we're just coming off of uh, whatever that mineral was in Death to the Daleks. I don't remember what it was called. Oh, yeah. Started with a P, I think. Yeah, I probably have it in my notes actually. Well, I'm not looking at that. Uh, no. Uh, no. Uh, no. You'll probably edit this part. Uh, I bet you I won't. Uh, uh, no. Uh, perineum. Perineum. That was it. It was called perineum. But yeah, I mean everything. 
going back all the way to whatever whatever it was in the sensorites, the molybdenum. That was it. You still remember that well, after that, all this time? Because that's a real thing. <coughs> yeah, I guess that's true. So, um, but yeah, so it it's interesting. I almost there's a part of me that almost wishes that this was sort of not not continuing like from uh, from death to the Daleks, but if it was still the perineum, um, like that could have been kind of interesting. Just sort of follow up on that a bit yeah. uh but i guess they pretty much got all they needed uh after blowing up the daleks as well so yeah so the tricilicate was interesting and yeah this whole issue of i mean P- peladon is a very interesting planet to do all of this because it honestly kind of reminds me of again i guess going back to star trek but uh with enterprise where it's like you know yes we have you know this earth ship the enterprise and it's going through and you know we're friends with the vulcans and boy everything you know we're just trying to figure things out at the beginning you know max we can go is like warp five and the vulcans were friends with the vulcans but they kind of don't like us like that that's the show where it's like yeah they're really trying to you know they're suppressing all those emotions because they got a lot they got they probably got a lot of opinions about humans But I like that it's basically the same here, where Peladon is this sort of, you know, backwards, you know, they say it's a feudal planet, and, but it's still so important to the Federation because of this Trisilicon and how that, uh, how that, like, works, how they deal with the Federation and stuff. Um, honestly, you could do, like, I feel like four more episodes on this planet and it would still work out, you know? Um, or even, like, I know Terry Nation always tried to spin off the Daleks. You can spin off Peladon, honestly, or just... I, I don't know. I, I don't know if it ever comes back after this, but it, that would be interesting. If, if they're looking to bring something back in the modern era, this would be a good planet to go back to. Um, I mean, they... <laughs> You can bring back anything from the classic era, pretty much. They recently brought back the Sea Devils, actually, so and made them pirates in like 1800s China. <laughs> so, it, it was an interesting episode. Well, didn't we uh, speculate when we first saw the Sea Devils? Because uh, I mentioned something. There was some kind of pirate group. Turned out to be the Sea Dogs. But uh, and we mentioned, you know. Sea Devils would be a great name for a bunch of pirates, and apparently somebody listened to us. So, yeah, our royalty check is in the mail. We assume. Yes. Uh, this. Yeah. Make sure, uh, Chris Chibnall, that you signed off on that properly. <laughs> that you're using the BBC's money to pay us. So, um, actually, we we'd just be happy with a trip to London. Yeah, for four. All expense paid. <laughs> trip to London. So, where all of the Doctor Who fans will. Uh, join us and they will bitch to us in person <laughs> so <laughs> we'll we'll save you guys the typing anywho we all meet at the fish and chip shop in Milton Hall my favorite spot in the three years that I lived there I I mean I was about to say is it still there I don't know why it wouldn't be there there well I looked up on Google uh, Earth I guess and went up to went up the road to where the old fish and chip shops used to be. There is still a fish and chip shop there. I don't know if it's the same one, but it, uh, again, uh, we lived on Queensway, and you go down to the main circle or what it was, and then there's a road that, that went off to the right, and it's about a block up there. So there is a fish and chip shop there. Again, that is the, probably one of the few things that the United States has never been able to duplicate. We can duplicate food from all over the world, but we cannot get fish and chips right. That We just cannot do it. I'm not even sure, like, what are fish and chips specifically. It's, well, the place we used to get, it's uh, Atlantic Cod. And the thing is, you literally could go to a fish and chip shop for dinner and eat fish that had been fresh caught in the Atlantic Ocean that morning. All right, so it's battered fried fish with really crispy on the outside, soft on the inside french fries. Put a little bit of malt vinegar on it, grab yourself a Fanta, that's your dinner. Hmm. All right. Well, if you're in the area, go enjoy that because we're we're not doing that anytime soon, probably. So, uh, let's see. Um, well, we had the return of the actual Agador, uh, which was interesting. I I still find that a bit weird that in the fifty years nobody like 
I mean, I guess I understand there still being a religion for it and stuff, but he's just an animal. Like, you just, you have an animal in a hole, and that's, I, I don't know, I, f- I figured, you know, after everything with Hepesh that maybe King Peladon would have changed something with yeah. that, so... Um, but no. But again, that's like the Rancor in Star Wars, you know, when Jabba the Hutt drops Luke down there. Yeah, that's true. And then Luke kills it, so Boba Fett has to get a new one once his show comes around. So, uh, let's see. Spoilers. Spoilers. <laughs> so, spoilers for the book of Boba Fett if you have not seen that. So, um,. Well, I guess honestly, we probably covered everything else. I'm I'm just curious, just where everyone fits in. Like we've got a lot of the obvious ones, like uh, with Gebek and uh, the other miners and stuff. But I'm very curious. Like, I, I guess maybe the the verdict's still out on Ortron, like where he falls in this. Like, is he in with uh, Eckersley and possibly the Ice Warrior, or is he not? Or is he just you know, is he just doing his own thing? I'm not sure, and I'm very curious. Just everything with Eckersley and the Ice Warrior. Yeah. So, um, This also just has some undertones of the French Revolution in it. You know, the aristocracy versus the bourgeoisie. Yeah. So, hopefully it doesn't end for the Queen like it, like the French Revolution did. So, Well, she's much more intelligent than Louis was. Yeah. Poor Louis. He was such an idiot. Yeah. And if you're in France right now, we do not... We do not personally condone the lobbing off of heads so i don't know go go find something else to eat i don't know but uh, i mean here's the thing uh if it weren't for louis the united states might not exist because he uh he and the french treasury essentially spent about 14 million dollars to help the united states win the revolutionary war but bankrupted the country in doing that and that's what literally led to his demise because the bourgeoisie ultimately rose up against him and said, you know, you're an idiot, which he was. I mean, he was a good guy, but he, again, unintended consequences. Yeah, so that's just, that's a strange thing. It's like he, he, you know, helped America, you know, uh, get going, but then that just sort of doomed him. It was like, was, well, was that good for France? I don't yeah, know. Part of the thing was the, the bourgeoisie realized that the people could overthrow their government uh, you know after louis bankrupted the country literally they and they were suffering they went wait a minute we did this to help the americans uh win their independence so why is it that we can't do the same thing here uh in france and end up again doing the same thing in france yeah so you're welcome france i guess anyway but i don't know like what sort of special dish the french could eat like fish and chips um, uh See, that's the thing. I, I, we didn't really ever eat at French restaurants because uh, we pretty much lived from the base commissary. Uh, French are, of course, famous for escargot. Only tried that once. It's like, you know, boiling the tires off your car in garlic and butter and trying to eat them. Uh, but again, I, I've always said the most memorable meal I've ever had in 70 years is when we were coming back from France. We had a two-day layover in Paris before we could catch the, the flight back. And we went to a very nice hotel. The Air Force put us up in this hotel. And uh, in the hotel restaurant, I had potato soup with fresh croissants and real butter and I can't remember if it was apricot or peach jelly for dessert. And I, seriously, I mean, that was 1959 and I still remember that meal. Because the French really know how to make good soup. Yeah. So go eat that, France. And to everyone else in the world, I don't know, go find something in your pantry. You can eat that. Anywho. Is that um, it? Yeah, pretty much. I, I guess the only other thing is, again, uh, it sucks about the guy from Vega. the That satyr guy at the beginning. It's like, oh, this is an interesting design. He's just dead. So, oh well. I, I am still curious if the people are being killed or if they're being transported somewhere yeah. so I, they may just be killed but yeah. i don't know considering they completely disappear yeah. so i guess well i mean they're either being completely vaporized 
Or they're being transported somewhere yeah. else. So, And let us not forget there was that one clip of the rebels outside of the Citadel with the, what's it, Sonic Lance or whatever they called it. Yeah. So that may still figure into the whole works. Right. A bunch of rebels that don't know how to use it as well. Maybe that's more dangerous, yeah. honestly. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, we will have to see how this all resolves next week when we are not tired and uh, everything will be backed as it should be. You probably can't really tell. We talked about as much, so. Um, but yeah, got anything else? I got nothing. Then that is basically it. With all that being said, we're Alex and Ned from 7th Hour Films, and we will see you guys next time. Take care. All right, guys, thanks for watching this video. There's a bunch of links on screen if you want to go click around to any of those. There's a playlist for all of our Doctor Who classic reactions, as well as another playlist for all of my Doctor Who reactions. Legend of the Sea Devils came out if you didn't check that out. There's also a subscribe button and a Patreon button on screen, as well as other links in the description if you want to go check out any of those. See you guys later.